Sri Lanka has had a rich history of activism where the power of the people has defined the direction of this country and shaped the future. Just recently, last year, we saw a massive citizen mobilization where tens and thousands of citizens came out to the streets demanding for a system change. People from different backgrounds, ages, gender, religion, ethnicity, came together, united in their call for a change and political accountability. This resulted in the resignation of a powerful president and government, things that were not even considered possible previous to last year. And it showed that the people's voices mattered. What is this power of the people? It's a broad definition of a social movement that unites people in challenging unjust and undemocratic moves. We have seen different shades of people's power across the world, across the decades. We have seen protests in the Arab Springs, South Africa, Latin America. More recently, we have seen protests in Hong Kong, farmers' protests in India, and the Black Lives Matter movement in the United States. All of this has brought about people united in challenging injustices and undemocratic moves. So we have seen over the decades, over the years, across the world, change where people get united and stand together with a clear demand. In Sri Lanka too, we have seen protests that has got people to the streets. The first example I want to speak about is on enforced disappearances. Sri Lanka has a horrific caseload of enforced disappearances. We have the second highest caseload in the world. This is when families, loved ones, are unaware as to what happens to their children, family members, loved ones. And this has affected communities across the country, from communities, families in the south affected by violence, to communities affected by the war in the north and east. In the 1980s, enforced disappearances mobilized mothers who came to the streets demanding to find out what happened to their loved ones. The picture, the black and white picture, captures at that time the protests of the mothers and the formation of the Mother's Front. Similar movements were seen with the Madres and the Abuelas in Argentina and in other parts of the world. More recently, we have seen protests of family members who've been protesting for over 2,000 days, 2,000 days in the North and East. And all of this is uniting families, communities, victims, asking for something very fundamental. Where are our loved ones? The fact that they were able to mobilize pressure and agitate for decades kept the pressure going. And in 2018, the then government recognized enforced crim uh, disappearances and criminalized enforced disappearances and operationalized the first independent office called the Office on Missing Persons to investigate and inquire into missing and disappearances. This basic step in the state recognizing this crime was an important step, but it didn't stop and provide answers and justice for the families who continue to protest and agitate to find out what happened to their loved ones. The other example I want to speak about is more recent. 
How many of you remember what happened on a Friday night in late October in 2018? This was when the then Prime President fired the then Prime Minister and swore in a new Prime Minister. And with it, starting a constitutional crisis in Sri Lanka. It created uncertainty, instability, and raised multiple questions. Can the president ignore the constitution and do what he pleases? Can a new prime minister be sworn in when there is no indicator of a resignation? Amidst these multiple questions, people agitated for 52 days. For 52 days, we saw people protesting, organizing vigils, meetings, debates, discussions on the constitutional and political consequences. And several of us went to the Supreme Court challenging the president's move. And the Supreme Court in November that year gave an interim order. And a few weeks later, the Supreme Court gave a final order holding the president's move unconstitutional and with it bringing an end to a constitutional crisis in Sri Lanka. Now, both these examples and many others show that people's voices matter. People's power has impact. But change is never easy, nor is it immediate. We have seen things that have started small, but expand into something bigger. We remember how last year, in March 2022, how a few individuals organized a vigil in Kohuala. That was in March. They came together in protest of the long power cuts and the long lines to get essential items. I, like so many others, joined these neighborhood protests in the demand that corrupt practices had to end that resulted in the economic crisis. And these neighborhood protests spread across Sri Lanka, expanded, and showed that the people's voices cannot be ignored. It showed that a something small can start into something big. But 2022, many of you remember what 2022 happened, but it didn't happen in a vacuum. In 2021, we had the P2 protests. That was when a handful of individuals walked from Potuil in the eastern province, walked for several days to Polikandi in the northern province. This was a walk by a few of Tamil and Muslim communities united in the demand to recognize their rights. What started small as a walk ended up as something bigger, where over 1,000 people were present at the last day. And this was despite the state, the government, attempting to get court orders to prevent the walk, using force, using harassment, using threats to prevent people from walking to demand for their rights. Around the same time, we have seen other protests in Sri Lanka. We saw the farmers protest in their inability to cultivate. We saw fisher communities protesting in their inability to go fishing. We have seen teachers, trade unions, students, and many others protesting for their voice to be heard, demanding for change. And that all showed the potential of the people's voice. So when we speak about the potential of people's power, we need to remember a couple of things. As I said, it can start small. It can be a neighborhood protest. But the tr impact of something you start can transform into something bigger. It can be local, 
It could be something you do in your neighborhood or your workplace. It could be something you start to bring about change. Or as we have seen in our recent past, it could be broader, it could be national. Agitation, mobilization is never linear. There is no one method, there is no one strategy, there is no one tool. And this is something we need to think about as to how best to organize. Agitation, protest, asking the difficult questions can also be messy. We have seen violence being used against those who dare to critique, those who dare to challenge, those who dare to ask questions. Over the decades, over the years, we have seen people being threatened, harassed, having to face violence, but this has not prevented people from asking for change. And what we can learn from our experiences is that people continue to mobilize, continue to agitate, and there is perseverance and resilience in what they do. So I want to leave you with something Professor Catherine Sicking has written about. She's from the Harvard Kennedy School, and I was fortunate to work with her in my time at Harvard. She has written a book called The Evidence of Hope. In that book, she writes, you need a combination of anger, hope, and belief to bring about change. She says, anger is needed to propel action, but action alone is insufficient to bring about change. For change to be sustained, we need to have hope and belief that it is possible. So if we build on what Professor Sicking has written and our own experiences, it's important to remember that action, anger can propel something, but we need perseverance, we need resilience, and we need to have the stamina to see through change. We need to have hope that our action, however small, can make a difference and the belief that we can make a change. But there are different strategies and tools one needs to also remember. Protesting is not the only way of agitating, of raising issues. We can have public petitions, vigils, filing cases like what I do. But we also can use creativity. The power of the visual was seen last year and in recent times. We have seen the power of images, of visuals, of artwork, of movies, that sends a strong message and capture the imagination of the people. Communication, too, is critical. We need to be able to have messages that are sharp, that are clear, that connect with people. In a generation of TikToks and hashtags, we need to be able to resonate with our demands with the people. So there's a whole play, things at play that we need to remember. But there are five things I want to leave you with today. Finding the balance of anger, hope, and belief is critical. Using peaceful, creative, effective strategies in whatever you decide to do in terms of change is important. And finding allies in this journey is critical. We need to stand united and persist with our demands despite the numerous setbacks and challenges we are likely to face. And finally, we need to remember to celebrate those small victories. We should never forget the potential of our voices. Remember, a protest, a vigil started by a few, transformed into something much bigger. When we travel uncharted territories and face multiple uncertainties and new challenges, 
we need to remember that our voice matters, that your voice matters. It is this that gives us hope that we can bring change and the belief that we can make a difference. Thank you.